Okay, I guess we'll get started. So, as you can probably tell from, or maybe not, from the title of this talk, we're going to talk about some aspects related to nutrition. Mainly this impacts things like metabolic health, potentially body composition, as we'll discuss. And hopefully this is going to open you up to some ideas that may be slightly different from what we typically think of as true around what are the main things we need to take care of with nutrition as we'll come to. Uh, a small bit of housekeeping before we get started. You will get access to all these slides. I'll give you a link at the end where you can download them. I'm also going to give you a list of all the references to every paper that's going to be touched on here. Because of the time, I don't have as much time to get into specific studies as much as I would like. So there will be some I will skim through, other ideas I will just put out there, but they will all be feedback of this list of references that I want to give you. And I'll also include a list of other resources that will relate to this topic specifically. So the real idea is to cover four elements related to nutrition that may have a different role than we typically think of due to their impacts on circadian biology or our circadian rhythms. And I will explain some of that before maybe some of you who are a bit newer to that concept. So we're going to hopefully get to a point where we think about how does the timing of nutrients and food ingestion potentially impact our health. We'll look at does calorie distribution matter? So not only on average how many calories we're consuming or the size of a, uh, calories in a meal, but how we distribute that across the day. We're going to talk about consistency. This is not consistency of habits. This is more talking about the regularity in which we have meal timing and meal frequency. So essentially the opposite of erratic eating where meal timing and frequency changes dramatically from day to day. And then we're going to touch on the feeding fasting cycle, which will make more sense as we go through this. But trying to get to the point of, is there some type of optimal or at least better way to think of what a feeding window should be and how long of a fasting window we should have on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, to get to some of this stuff, I'm going to have to take a step back and kind of build up to <coughs> this make sense in a nutrition sense by talking about a different field of chronobiology. So the very simple way to think of this is uh, biological processes that essentially have some time-based rhythm. So there are lots of things that in biology are dictated by this. And a simple one to think of is the cycle of hibernation and wakefulness in animals. Like this happens regularly at the same time and it just cycles back and forth. So there are some things that happen on a very short-term cycle, some on a much longer time scale, like you said, and something in between. We're going to look at a very specific branch of chronobiology today, as I'll come to. But to get the idea of why cycles of different biological processes are important, the four that I'm really going to talk about today are going to be our wake-sleep cycle. So we have these two completely opposing processes that we switch back and forth between. One is not better than the other. Having one of them all the time is not good. And having none of them is not good. The important thing for health is how do we, the magnitude of each, and how do we switch back and forth between them. So not only do we have our wake sleep cycle that's important, we're going to talk about our light dark uh, cycle. So the same thing, having complete light exposure all the time is not good. Same as complete darkness. So I'm sure a lot of people will have seen a lot of the literature on uh, avoiding blue light at night, right? And artificial light or iPads at night because blue light is bad. And that's true at night time, and we're going to discuss some of that, but we actually want the opposite in the morning. So it's cycling between these two processes. Feeding and fasting is an obvious one. We're going to spend a bit of time looking at these. Again, two completely opposing processes, and activity and rest. There's a whole host of pretty much every other biological process you can think of. So when we talk about being anabolic or catabolic, it's not a one is better than the other. We want them at the appropriate times, and we want to cycle back and forth between them. It's the same way when you're driving, you don't put your foot on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. You want to go back and forth between them. One is not more important than the other, it's abusing them appropriately. So how this relates to what we're going to talk about, there are many, again, these cycles or rhythms within the body that are extremely important for our health. Something like our core body temperature follows a predictable rhythm every day. So this is a, a kind of average one you'll see, where you reach a peak, 
maybe around 4 or 5 p.m. typically. It dips down when you reach a minimal point during the night, and that's kind of an important part of sleep as well. And this rhythm will repeat itself every day. We have other processes like certain hormones. This one that we'll talk about today is going to be melatonin, and a lot of you will relate that to either sleepfulness or dealing with jet lag, and we will come to that. But again, you have this low amount of melatonin throughout the day. It's going to slightly increase, or at least it should, in the evening. We get past a certain threshold a few hours before sleep and helps with the onset of sleep, and it's important. Now, what you'll notice about these two in particular, and why you want to draw your attention to them, is that they're running on a daily basis, so this 24-hour rhythm. And so when I talk about that branch of biology, chronobiology, we have a specific one related to circadian biology. So the circadian part, or circadian rhythm, as you've heard of, relates to something centering around a 24-hour rhythm. Now, we have things that could be on the 24-hour rhythm that aren't necessarily circadian. So um, any pattern that we call diurnal, you may have seen that in research papers, is something that runs on a daily pattern. What makes something a circadian rhythm is that that process is endogenously controlled in that cell. So without the influence of anything around it, without the influence of temperature, light, anything else, that cell can control that rhythm to keep it running on this 24-hour cycle. Now, it's about 24 hours, and that's an important thing, that on average, and again, this is just a bit simplistic, but typically when you think about this endogenous circadian rhythm we have to, to a lot of this stuff, it's not exactly 24 hours. For some people, some circadian rhythms can run a bit shorter. For the majority of people, it's actually a bit longer. And on average, you may see it somewhere around 24 hours and 15 minutes is how the kind of typical period of um, these rhythms, if they were left to their own devices, and they would stay repeating at this. Now, that's not in of itself a problem. However, it's a problem when we consider that we have a 24-hour day, and our behaviors are typically centered around that 24-hour day. So the time we wake up, the time we're going to be going to work, our sleep times, activity times, and so on. So if we don't have it set to exactly 24 hours, but our day is exactly 24 hours, then over time it's going to be more and more desynchronized with that day. Does that make sense? So luckily we have this great ability to be able to refine those rhythms down more precisely to that 24-hour day. The way we do that, and it kind of makes sense, our body's able to use cues in its environment to say, is it day, is it night, how do I find it to this 24-hour day that we typically are exposed to? So we have these different stimuli in our, in our environment, we call them Zeitgebers, it's a very German word. Essentially a stimulus that allows us to entrain or set that rhythm to a more precise pattern. So the main one, as you may suggest, that, set, that sets our main circadian clock is light. So we get light exposure, so if you go outside on any particular day, you get these photons of light coming to the eye, they hit these specialized cells within the retina, um, so there's a, a specific photopigment uh, called melanopsin there, it can detect this light, and it sends a signal up to our central circadian clock, which is located in the brain. And more specifically, this is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN, and it's basically a bundle of neurons, about 20 or 30,000 neurons that's located in the hypothalamus of the brain. And this is our main circadian clock. And by that I just mean that that is the thing that regulates all these circadian patterns primarily in the body. So it's the main regulator of those things like core body temperature and melatonin that I put up. So we have this main circadian clock that's located in the brain. Now, what all this is to do with nutrition is that not only do we have this main circadian clock, because most people are kind of aware of that, if you've ever had jet lag from travel, we kind of colloquially say things like, oh, my body clock is off, right? So we have this main circadian clock, but we also have circadian clocks in all tissues around the body, these clocks that we call peripheral clocks. So if we were to take a few ones that are going to relate for at least our purposes around nutrition, we have these Circadian clocks located in the periphery, in the pancreas, the heart, intestine, muscle, fat tissue, and immune cells, and therefore can have potentially a circadian basis to things like insulin secretion, food absorption, and so on. 
So we have this main circ circadian clock in the brain, and we have these circadian clocks located in tissues all around the body. Now, why this becomes an issue is there is something called circadian alignment, which, as the name suggests, is something that we would like. This is when those circadian rhythms are aligned in the way that we want. They're running at the time to one, and those different clocks are aligned and running in a uh, synchronous fashion. So let's, again, this is a very simplified uh, model, but I think it's across the idea. Let's say we have a particular rhythm that runs over multiple days like this. That's a process regulated by the central circadian clock. And then we have uh, related processes regulated by the peripheral clock in these different tissues that's running kind of in line with that. What can happen due to a number of things is we can have something called a phase shift, where that pattern gets shifted, either we can have a phase delay, which is delaying that response, or a phase advance moving it forward. Essentially, we can move those patterns. So if we think of the central clock, for example, how you would cause a phase shift here might be a change in your light uh, dark exposure, the uh, travel time, and so on. But if we have the timing of processes with the central clock and these peripheral clocks out of sync, we can call this circadian misalignment. But this is one way to be circadian misalignment. Another way is to think about this is if we have something that's regulated by this endogenous circadian rhythm that we have within the body that runs in a certain fashion, we want to have certain behaviors line up with that. And we mentioned some of the behaviors like when we get light exposure, when we have dark exposure, when we sleep, when we wake. We want to kind of line those up. Now, we can have certain behaviors that would cause a shift in some of these that put our behavioral cycle out of sync with that circadian cycle that we would like. And that's what we're going to try and get to today. So before we get to the nutrition stuff, very briefly, you might think, well, what is the big deal with circadian misalignment? What actually occurs? The kind of short answer is nothing really escapes from being messed up if someone is in circadian misalignment. So just some examples, and we don't have time to get through these exact papers, uh, but we see in, you can do this cool thing, uh, circadian misalignment protocol in research, and in, uh, this is a paper by Frank Shears, really cool paper, but they measured some of the things that happen at maximal misalignment. So you see things like your hormone leptin drops by 20%. I think Eric mentioned leptin yesterday, so it's this hormone secreted by your fat cells. So it essentially can drop in response to a de decrease in calories, a uh, short-term energy availability marker, or when your body fat decreases, say, telling your body, hey, I've got a reduced amount of energy available here, or energy stored. So typically what we see then is if leptin is dropping, that's kind of a cue to say to your body, hey, we're got either less calories and or less fat mass, maybe we need to prevent this from continuing. <coughs> let's move around a bit less, let's go and seek out more food. We see a typical cortisol pattern, this is pretty normal, that you have cortisol starts high in the morning, which is a good thing, and it drops throughout the day, and it'll kind of gradually uh, work up throughout the night. In a misalignment situation, you basically have that completely flipped around. So a normal cortisol pattern just gets flipped. One that we're going to spend a bit of time looking at, particularly because we're going to talk about metabolic health, is we see changes in your glucose response to a meal. So the same meal, if you eat that when you're in circadian alignment or when someone has circadian misalignment, you see that you have a worse glucose response to that particular meal. You also see that the insulin response is a lot higher. So essentially, if you need more insulin to be secreted to be able to handle a certain amount of glucose, that is essentially a sign of, well, you can think of it as being more insulin resistant. Right? because you're not as sensitive, so you need more of this to cause that same drop. So just as a kind of nice way to sum up, from that paper, they look at a certain point in that study where we would have normal alignment for these subjects was waking up at 8 a.m. They looked at a postprandial response, so after eating a meal, the two hours afterwards, their glucose response, and they looked at the average of what that was. They compared that then to being in maximal misalignment, so over a number of days, they were able to shift these people's sleep and wake times to a point where now they were waking up at 8 p.m. and sleeping at 8 a.m., so completely the, the reverse. And you see the same meal in the same people, the average response dramatically different. And when you look at the individual numbers, so you see here on the, the left-hand side, this is your 
a two-hour glucose response, you see there's a bit of difference in kind of individual response. Some people not really as affected. So you start from this side of the line is alignment, and then this is after they're in the misalignment protocol. See some not as affected, most of them trending upwards, some having a very strong response. These dotted lines are uh, put in as, these are typically what you'd see as the cutoff points, or at least what the um, glucose response that you would typically expect to see in someone with pre-diabetes and then type 2 diabetes. So you see these three people, just from having this circular misalignment, end up with a postprandial glucose response that would be indicative of someone that's either pre-diabetic or has diabetes. Now this is not saying that it caused them to uh, become pre-diabetic, but at this particular point, they would have the same uh, response. So, where this all comes back to, we have this central clock is the main thing that influences these peripheral clocks. So these can be, it sets mainly those rhythms around the body, uh, core body temperature, melatonin. It also can regulate these clocks in these different tissues. Some other things can influence it that we don't have time to get into today. So for example, sleep, shift work, time zone travel, uh, social jet lag, which is something I'll actually come back to. This social jet lag is essentially the change in sleep and wake times that most people will have at a weekend compared to during the week. So that they have that shift in their circadian rhythm by a couple of hours because they're sleeping in, they're staying awake longer, doing that for a couple of days, Monday rolls around, and now they have to wake up to an alarm at an earlier time, and because of that, it's essentially some of the same symptoms of being jet lagged, because it's a life changing time zones. We also can have peripheral clocks influenced by uh, activity and exercise, but what we're of course going to focus on is the role of diet. So what we see is that there's a potential for feeding and the ingestion of nutrients to entrain or set the rhythms in these peripheral clocks. Now it sets those rhythms, but not necessarily influencing the main circadian clock, which is mainly regulated by light and dark cycles. So this is getting to the idea of, well, then maybe does that have implications for when we eat, and trying to line that up at a time that makes sense for light and dark exposure and our circadian uh, biology. So we talked about these different uh, cycles. <coughs> Theoretically, based on this notion, what we're trying to ask is, do we need to line up our timing of meals and the amount of calories we're consuming at certain best times? So what that might look like in relation to these uh, cycles would be having our wakeful time when it's bright out, having our feeding window within that time, and having activity windows within that time, and then there's darkness coming up with sleep, fasting, and rest. This seems pretty like reasonable, you're probably thinking, but there's many reasons where we get this uh, out of uh, context. So, with that said, it comes to this idea of this field of chrononutrition. Uh, so, the title of this talk being circadian eating is just a made up kind of colloquial term. You'll see this more readily in research. Chrononutrition essentially getting at that idea how does timing of nutrition relate to uh, circadian rhythms and potentially health. So as I think, I think James made a great point yesterday, he talked about how we never are going to take just one study and use that as the basis for anything. And we also know that there's kind of a hierarchy to evidence as well, that some things will give us better evidence than others. The thing with the field of chronic nutrition, it's super exciting, there's some cool stuff in the book we're going to show you, or so that the early stages of answering a lot of the questions that it poses particularly in high quality human trials. So to get you an idea of how I, or why at least I think it's important, I'm gonna try and get different areas of research and kind of piece them together in a puzzle to kind of get a better idea of what's going on. By that, what I mean is, first we're gonna look at some general observations. So this can be some observational research, not necessarily. There are gonna be some human trials as well. Um, but just not directly related to answering the circadian question, but piecing this together to see, okay, what type of association between timing uh, of nutrients and body composition and health do we actually see? Then we'll look and see, well, is there actually good mechanistic rationale that this would work? If it's not biologically plausible and there's no mechanisms by which it work, then we can kind of throw it out. We're going to look at then some of the animal data very, very briefly. Um, 
most of the really well-controlled trials that have been really informative in this field have been done in animals for obvious reasons. But with the benefits you gain from having highly controlled trials where you can do some cool stuff, you have the downside of it not being in humans. And then we'll kind of round that off to look at human trials that more specifically re relate to this concept of time-restricted feeding, which I'm sure many of you have came across. It's become uh, maybe a bit of a buzzword, but it's been at least become more popularized over the last couple of years. Essentially, if we shrink down the feeding window with you're eating within a certain number of hours, let's say an eight hour feeding window, does that have uh, benefits? And that may relate to intermittent fasting protocols you would have seen. However, time-restricted feeding is something that's born out specifically out of circadian research. And so we're going to look at not only the restriction of that window, but where we place that window as well. And so we're going to try and use a combination of these to get to some answers of where uh, we should include some things. So first, with some kind of general observations that we will notice. First one is that where we have circadian disruption, we see pretty much every bad thing that can happen typically happens, right? Most systems of the body get completely screwed up from uh, circadian mismatch and circadian disruption, and you have an increased risk of various different <coughs> metabolic diseases and chronic diseases. We know for a long time that shift work in itself has a huge implication for risk of chronic diseases, uh, metabolic dysfunction, and so on. There's lots of other stuff going on outside of when shift workers eat. That could be explaining that. So obviously, they're typically sleep restricted. Their light and dark exposure is different. Um, their ability to maybe get into training routines can be different, or their ability to have uh, compete in sports, for example, can be hampered by their typical work schedule. So there's a lot of stuff going on. But one of them may be that often they are forced to eat during the night. And what we see quite clearly is that when you or if you eat a meal during the night, if you consume that same meal during the day, how you metabolize that is drastically different. So your postprandial glucose response, for example, is going to be much worse if you have a meal at 3 a.m. if you would have that same meal during the middle of the day. This is something we also see with other uh, things, insulin, free fatty acid, and so on, which we'll come back to. Observationally, we see a lot of stuff like the breakfast skipping. Um, now, a lot of this stuff, I think, takes, gets taken out of uh, context and people jump to maybe illogical conclusions of what that may mean. I don't think that it's, or at least, I don't think it's uh, necessary to be healthy to eat as soon as you get up. That's not what we're really saying. But we do see typically that people who intermittently or fairly frequently skip breakfast at random are at least associated with higher BMIs, things like that. Now there's, again, a lot of mitigating factors, but one thing we also see with breakfast skipping is someone who, say, is used to having breakfast and skips breakfast on a particular day. Their postprandial glucose response to a lunch meal later in the day is that glucose excursion, so how high or how prolonged that increase in blood glucose is after that meal, is kind of worse than if they had a breakfast. Now there's some reasons for that, and there's actually some data suggesting that for people who uh, routinely and consistently don't eat breakfast, that kind of goes away. Uh, but I'll come back to that. As I've mentioned, late night eating, we see from just a metabolic standpoint, seems to be uh, a bad idea that you get a worse uh, postprandial response if you eat late at night. Also, you see kind of observations who people who typically put a lot of their calories very late at night or who habitually eat large meals late at night, again, associations with higher uh, body mass, BMI, uh, metabolic syndrome, and so on. We have this concept of metabolic jet lag, which was coined in, or at least the uh, first place I saw was in a paper by Gillen Panda. So it's similar to this idea of social jet lag, that we know that people's typical wake and sleep times shift at the weekend compared to during the week. For people who say work at 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, the same thing, that would lead to changes in typical uh, breakfast times and last meal of the day. So what we often see is that at the weekends, people's first meal tends to be a few hours later than it normally is. And then their final meal tends to be a bit later than it usually is. So that 
again, if we're thinking about food then train these peripheral clocks, that's causing a, maybe a shift to that degree, and they came up with this idea of metabolic jet lag. That same study looked at when do people typically consume their food. So uh, it was quite cool. They got, I think it was maybe 100 and something people. They had to use a smartphone app, and they would take a photo of their meal before and after consuming it, sort of track how much people were eating, exactly what they were eating, but it also sent a timestamp of when that meal was consumed to the researchers. So they were able to collect all this data of what people were eating and when. And what they saw was, on average, most typically, people have very erratic eating behaviors in that from day to day, the number of meals that was having could be dramatically different. And the times they consumed them could be dramatically different from day to day. So this is what they would categorize as kind of erratic eating as opposed to a consistent meal pattern from day to day. And we'll come back to why that may be important. That same study showed that the average for most people is a prolonged feeding window which simply means that most people were having some food within uh, pretty soon after waking up. So this could be any nutrient ingestion. It could be a coffee with milk, for example. And they would have their final calorie ingestion very late at night as well. So on average, it was about 15 hours of a feeding window that is common to see in most people's normal eating patterns. And it's probably, when we think about that, probably pretty average for what we would uh, expect. With the time of the largest meal, again, we've seen some observational work that people who place their largest meal early in the day tend to have better outcomes for uh, body weight, better outcomes for um, some of those uh, glycemic markers like either fasting glucose, postprandial glucose response, and so on. We've seen some more kind of controlled studies look at this too. So there's a couple of studies out of the uh, University of Murcia, yeah, I think, uh, in Spain, which is a Mediterranean region. And they looked at where people had their largest meal of the day. Now, for a Mediterranean region, they have their largest meal typically as lunch as opposed to dinner. So there was two studies. One was a kind of observational in nature. They looked at did people have that meal before or after 3 p.m. in the day? And they see differences in, again, metabolic outcomes and typical uh, BMI in people that had the earlier lunch. In other words, the earliest, their biggest meal of the day was a bit earlier compared to later in the day. They then did an intervention study where they controlled the same three meals in the two groups, but they either had that biggest meal of the day, so their lunch is the biggest in this population, so about 40% of their calories. They either had that at 1.30 in the afternoon or 4.30 in the afternoon. And they saw differences in those same kind of markers based on that. The same idea here with calorie distribution uh, was looked at by uh, actually a few papers by Daniel Yakubovich's uh, lab in Tel Aviv. They did one really cool study where they had two groups eat the same number of calories, the exact same number of macronutrients, and it's a dieting study for 12 weeks. So they put people on 1,400 calories a day and matched for calories and macronutrients. We're checking with a dietitian bi weekly, and anyone who was what they termed more than 10% non complying with that on any given week was dropped from uh, the study. So what they saw was pretty dramatic, and we'll try to investigate why this, they might have saw this. So the difference between the two groups was they had a large breakfast group, which had 700 calorie breakfast, 500 calorie lunch, and a 200 calorie dinner. They then had a large dinner group, which was just the reverse. So 200 calories at breakfast, same 500 calorie lunch, and then 700 calories at dinner. The difference over the 12 weeks, both groups lost weight, as you'd expect from that number of calories. But you see the group that had the large breakfast lost, on average, about 8.7 kilos. The group in the large dinner group lost 3.6, I think, 3.5, 3.6. So again, something is going on that we have to think about, but we see this dramatic difference. Um, on the second week of the study, they also looked at what would be the changes in their uh, postprandial glucose response. Because as you'd expect, at the end of the study there was differences, but a lot of that could be explained just because they lost more weight. But even within the second week of the study, before there was a difference in weight loss, you see improvements for the large breakfast group. So at least gives us some kind of observation of to ask, well, how could this be and what could be going on? Is this just down to chance or is something else going on? So to try and look at some of the mechanisms here, uh, there's a few things, again, I don't 
time to uh, get to as much detail as I'd like. But here's some things to be aware of, things that we do see that may at least explain some of the things we're seeing. One of the kind of things that is pretty consistent that we see is differences in beta cell function. So beta cells are in your pancreas, they're related to insulin uh, secretion. And we see a difference in your beta cell function from morning time to evening time. So again, you could think of it as a kind of circadian uh, basis for this that gives a difference, or it's more of a diurnal, diurnal pattern that it changes across the day in beta cell function. We've already talked about when someone is in circadian alignment, they have better insulin sensitivity. And we also see that insulin sensitivity changes across the day as well. So it starts up highest in the morning and gets worse throughout the day. So that may explain why if you have the same meal early in the day versus late in the day, you might get a different postprandial glucose response because of the differences in insulin sensitivity. Other things we see based on a kind of pattern like this is in response to a meal, if you look at gastric emptying, so that's the kind of transit time for uh, a meal's digestion, you see there's differences between the morning and the evening, so how fast uh, of a uh, gastric emptying you have. One of the things that may, may explain, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure this can explain totally those differences we see in, in body composition, but if we know groups are getting the same number of calories, then we kind of know, well, maybe something's going on with energy expenditure, right? Maybe eating a certain way is changing their energy expenditure. One potential hypothesis has been it changes your diet-induced thermogenesis, so the calories used in digestion that meal. And at least uh, this paper by Chris Morris shows that we see quite big differences in your diet-induced thermogenesis from morning time to evening time. So that would indicate potentially one of the things that's going on so if you have a large meal early in the day versus late in the day, you consume the same number of calories, but the calories you used in that kind of digestion of that could be different. So it's changing energy balance in that manner. With postprandial energy expenditure, so the energy you expend in that kind of postprandial period, that time after consuming a meal, we see differences between morning and evening time. And then one of the studies that came out of Bath University, uh, James Betts, uh, did this study, the big breakfast study, or uh, the Bath breakfast study. They see that there was, they compared a group that had a 700 calorie breakfast, so a big breakfast, versus the other group that skipped uh, breakfast altogether and didn't eat until 12 p.m. So what they saw in these two groups was that they end up eating a different number of calories. You see that group that ate 700 calories, ate more of the day. But there was no difference in any changes in body composition, even though they were kind of eating more. So when they looked at their energy expenditure, they saw there was differences in how much energy each group was expending, and specifically it was down to physical activity thermogenesis. So there was no real change in a metabolic rate, there was, like I just mentioned a moment ago, there was a difference in that diet-induced thermogenesis, but we'd expect that because they're eating a different number of calories anyway. But there was also an increase in how much calories they're expending just for the physical activity they were doing across that day. So potentially this may explain why they were able to see these differences. Another kind of mechanistic piece of this puzzle of why maybe erratic eating could be problematic. Uh, this is a paper again out of the UK, Al Hussein. They looked at a regular eating pattern. So this was three main meals and three snacks eaten every day for two weeks. And then the other condition was an irregular meal pattern. So this varied their meal frequency from three meals up to nine meals a day, anywhere in between that changing every day over the two weeks. So one day it could be three meals, next day it could be six, then it could be four, then it could be nine, be five, seven, changing back and forth this every day for two weeks. At the end of that study, we see uh, differences here, as you can see, in the postprandial glucose based on that, which again is something that hints at maybe there is something to having a more consistent and regular meal pattern as opposed to eating erratically. So the things that we can take from that is this kind of works bi-directionally, that we have some things that have a circadian rhythm that will influence maybe how we should think about our food choices. So for example, there's a circadian rhythm to gastric emptying or insulin uh, sensitivity, that's gonna happen. So maybe that would influence how we choose or when we choose to eat certain meals. 
Also, then we know it goes the other way, that when we have a meal, that in itself influences some of these circadian patterns. The, let's see, I'm doing plan The animal data is where we've had most of the really highly controlled uh, studies, specifically in like time-restricted feeding models. I'm not going to get too into that today because what's really more of interest to you guys is where we are with the human stuff. And the animal data, the thing that about it is it's incredibly consistent. And so I was going to go through like all different stuff, but basically a short way of thinking of it is if you put a rat on a time-restricted feeding model, they just everything gets better. So you can have them, um, if you just restrict their feeding window, you tend to see improvements. But beyond that, you can give a rodent a obesogenic diet, so that the type of diet you would typically use in the lab to fatten a rat, so high sugar, high fat, one that they typically consume lots of, you can give them that diet, but if you just restrict the feeding window, they don't gain weight and don't become insulin resistant, which is what we normally see. We see things like all, pretty much any marker you can measure for health that you want to look at in these rodents, you can find something on a time restricted feeding protocol improving that. So what's more relevant is, how does that translate to humans, if at all? Now there's still, uh, kind of, as I said, early stages here, but there are some that we can look at to potentially answer this question. The first one I'll talk about is a pilot study. The reason why I bring this up is, yeah, it's not that highly controlled, but why I like this is this is showing how a simple intervention and why this type of feeding strategy may be useful at a a large scale, like a very scalable thing to do with the population because of how simple it is to implement. So all they did was they took in people in this 10 week intervention, and this was the University of Surrey. They compared either people continuing on with their habitual diet or this time restricted feeding protocol. All that protocol consisted of is telling people to do two things. Your normal breakfast time, just delay that for an hour and a half. And then your last meal of the day, just bring that forward by an hour and a half. Nothing else changed. Nothing to do with your the types of food you consume, what meals you want, how much to consume. The only thing they asked them to do was delay breakfast and advance dinner. And what you see in that study is that intervention at least showed a dramatic decrease in the number of calories those people were consuming. Now, some of you may think, well, that's kind of obvious, you have less time to eat, whatever. But there's no limitation on people eating to uh, or restricting or feeding them to under eat. So this, happened over this kind of 10 week intervention, and because of that, obviously, we saw differences in uh, body fat loss, and then, therefore, some of these metabolic markers. A, that earlier study I mentioned, that Gillen Panda study, where they did um, that, they use a smartphone app and got people to track, and they did over 100 people. So that was like this three week baseline part of the study. From there, they took eight subjects from that study. So they were looking for eight people who had a long feeding window. So they, their normal feeding window was more than 14 hours per day. And they had a high BMI, so it was above 25. And they put them in this intervention study for 16 weeks. Now, the cool thing about this study, what I liked was, they used an eight hour time restricted feeding model, but they allowed people to kind of self-select when that would occur. So again, something that's kind of quite <coughs> So all this is is just from morning until night. You see the red bars is just their usual feeding window, and you see they everyone just shrunk their down to fit eight hours. But people could self-select what time of day they wanted their feeding window to start and stop, as long as it was eight hours. And within that intervention, you saw an average decrease of over three kilos in body weight, and a year follow-up after that intervention, you see people that maintain that same body weight, which is incredibly rare for most of the dieting studies we see. Now again, you may say three, like three kilos from just that intervention seems pretty impressive to me at least, if we're able to maintain that. We see a similar thing in a paper from last year, uh, Gable, same thing, this was in, um, I believe, people with obesity. Um, 23 people, put them on a time restricted feeding protocol, first meal at 10 a.m., final meal at uh, 6 and you see uh, loss of uh, body weight. I think it was uh, about three kilos as well in this study. What happens when we kind of try and control for body weight? 
So we're able to look at some of those other metabolic markers without having this influence of weight loss. A couple of studies have looked at this. Um, this one looked at a protocol called early time restricted feeding. And this, again, theoretically <coughs> may be at least uh, being uh, proposed, could be even better in terms of circadian biology because we're placing more of those calories earlier in the day. So this protocol is one of the ones that's probably not as implementable at scale because as you can see in this particular study, they had their final meal at 2 p.m. of the day. The idea was to compare if we had the same meals, so three meals matched in these two groups, with just a difference in how long their fasting window was, are we going to see any difference? So they put on a continuous glucose monitor, which basically takes uh, glucose measurements every five minutes. And um, uh, I'll get to the same thing. So the same protocol had been used previously and the year before by Sutton as well. So the same thing, 12 hours versus 18 hours of a fasting window. So just different times of when they were consuming this. What you see um, in the, both these studies, both these studies were crossover studies. So everyone did each of those conditions. So they did the first, so they either did early time restricted feeding, and then a while later they did the control condition, or vice versa. So everyone did both. You see improvements in uh, things we've already seen, changes in insulin secretion, so decrease here for the early time restricted feeding group. You see an increase in beta cell function. So again, beta cells of pancreas, including insulin, and you see a drop in insulin resistance uh, with that model. Uh, that was the, uh, the same thing in the original I showed the Jamshed one, where we see uh, glucose excursions were lower in the early time treated feeding group. So both of those studies were where we controlled for weight loss by essentially preventing weight loss from occurring and seeing was there still differences in these glycemic markers. One of the studies that has been used to kind of see, well, is there a difference then, or is there a benefit to this early time restricted feeding model over one that's delayed to later in the day? Uh, this is only from the last couple of months. And so you see in the early one, the feeding window is from 8 to 5, and the late it's 12 p.m. to 9. So both groups had a 9 hour feeding window. Within this, you see, uh, so if you, this graph is of their uh, baseline uh, before the study started, their glucose over the course of uh, three hours. After the seven days of the study, you see that there was a slight difference in the mean glucose, but really not that much. There were no real significant differences in all that much of anything. Slight difference in the mean glucose uh, for the early time shift group but nothing really to shout out about, but both groups considerably better than when they started even just seven days previous. <coughs> you kind of see a similar thing with uh, insulin over uh, time course too. So there's lots of other studies that kind of get into similar things, but they're the main ones that get across some of the points where I think we're at. Um, there's been a couple of other models that I've looked at late intermittent fasting that haven't been really reported from a circadian perspective and will show the maybe benefits for body composition or at least no downsides. But when you look at some of the markers, you, you could make a case that maybe it's not so great to be bulking those calories later in the evening. So where does that kind of leave us? Again, some of this stuff still needs to be worked out in humans, and I'll be the first to say I would go and completely change everything you're doing with your nutrition or things you would advise your clients to do based on this. But I think there are some things that I think are fairly well, or I'm fairly happy to kind of put my faith in. And there are some that I'll throw out there that maybe we need to wait and see. So with regards to timing, the kind of obvious one is eating at, during the biological night tends to be pretty bad for metabolic health. And this is something that you see in Lots of studies that look at shift workers, for example, or even very late night eating or late night eating syndrome, you see a worse kind of postprandial metabolism with very late night eating. So maybe that might not be the best idea. The other part of timing that is I'm still not sure about that people can make a case for in relation to circadian biology is well, when we get up in the morning, we want to get early light exposure. 
that's typically a good thing for our circadian rhythms. That early in the day, ideally daylight as opposed to artificial light, we can get some light exposure, even if it's a cloudy day. Um, so that's one of the things that a lot of us don't realize because our eyes aren't sensitive enough to detect it. But even bright artificial light like we're in here may be something of the magnitude of a thousand lux, which is a measure of light intensity. Even on a cloudy day outside, like it is here in Melbourne today, you may have something that could be 10 times that light intensity. And on a sunny day in the summer, that could be 100 times that light intensity. And so getting some light exposure early in the day is probably a good idea. Now, with nutrition, then someone could probably say, well, should we time some nutrient ingestion with that? So again, if that's in training these peripheral tissues and we sync it up with our light exposure, could that be beneficial? Makes logical sense to me. How much or what is the magnitude of that effect? I'm unsure. How closely to wake time do we need to time that first meal? I'm kind of unsure. I would lean to probably in the early part of the day, I would suggest some nutrient ingestion. But again, I'm not completely um, sold on the magnitude of that effect, all other things being equal. But it would make some sense. Luckily, there's, it's I should be clear that doesn't mean you need to have a very large breakfast in those kind of first early part of the day, things that can entrain these peripheral clocks is really any metabolizable nutrient. So we've seen some studies show the same thing with caffeine, so if you have a black coffee, that still can exert a similar influence on set, or at least being detected in these peripheral clocks, and so may have a role there, but I'm just unsure about that. On the calorie distribution, again, the magnitude of the effect and how much you need to worry about it, I can't be totally sure. But I think of most of this picture I've tried to paint is that I think there is at least good reason to take into account maybe if something is more beneficial than the other, would be biasing calories maybe slightly earlier in the day. So that might mean just not having a super large meal very late at night, trying to partition more of those earlier in the day. Maybe um, having bigger meals earlier in the day can influence your energy expenditure later in the day. So I think all of those are valid. There are some, uh, there is some kind of nuance that I'll put to that in a moment, which would probably be relevant for most of the people in this room. But I think that may make sense to have at least a bias towards, not super early, but at least earlier for a majority of uh, intake, for example. I think it's pretty reasonable to say we should avoid erratic eating patterns if we're looking just at some of the data on how that impacts metabolic health. So I think that's a pretty safe assumption. I'm happy to say that, yeah, probably erratic eating is probably not uh, ideal. And with the feeding fasting cycle, I think it looks uh, pretty promising that having at least some degree of a restricted feeding window can have health benefits. So in other words, try not to be in like a consistent postprandial state all day long, where you're eating something first thing in the morning, you're continuing to eat throughout the day, and eating something very late at night, where you don't really have any of this type of uh, a fasting window within there. So I think shrinking eating window is probably very useful in general for a lot of people. I think maybe more so for people that, that uh, maybe general population, people at risk of, um, say, prediabetes, some <coughs> metabolic syndrome, things like that, may respond pretty well to that. I think there's some pretty easy implementation there too, as we've seen, in that it's a very easy to understand rule. It's a basic heuristic people can use of, oh, I just change when I usually have my first or my last meal, or I finish eating at a certain time point, like I have a cutoff of 7 p.m., whatever the rule is. It's very easy to understand, easy to implement, and not too much decision making to be done around it. So to kind of finish off, where are there some things to be aware of here that may be contraindicated, maybe some considerations where you might not want to use this. One thing that I've thought of, and I haven't seen this in, directly in looking at this from a circadian perspective, but one of the things that we know, that when you do exercise, specifically when you do uh, resistance training, and you get that muscle contraction, one of the cool things that happens is that you have this movement of the glucose transporter that's inside your muscle cell from the inside the cell to the surface of that cell. Now what a glucose transporter does is it allows you to move glucose from your bloodstream into that cell. 
So the way we normally do this is that's one of the roles, at least of insulin, right? Insulin attaches to an insulin receptor and it signals for these glucose transporters to allow the movement of glucose into the cell. Now, one of the cool things about this movement of these glucose transporters after, say, you go and lift some weights, is that you have that movement of glucose, that glucose disposal can happen independently of insulin. So now if we're thinking about, well, we know your insulin sensitivity goes down throughout the day, so maybe you don't handle carbohydrates as well at night as you would earlier in the day, but say if you've just done some training at 6 p.m., now when you consume carbohydrates, you can actually dispose of that glucose pretty readily without needing to rely on insulin, so it may not be a big deal. So I think, to me, that makes sense that if you're consuming a large bulk of calories or carbohydrates after a training session, for example, some of these considerations may not be as much of a problem. Similarly, other places where some of these pieces of advice that I've given out, these, these basic heuristics, may not be the best, is depending on who you're working with. If you're working on someone whose primary goal is athletic performance, particularly if they're a high-end athlete, let's say you're working with someone who may train multiple times a day, and now we're trying to say, well, don't want to have too much calories or carbohydrates late at night, or let's try and keep your feeding window quite short, let's put more of your calories early in the day. That may not be the best for their recovery from a certain session or for their performance for a next session. So again, there may be some uh, contraindications there. Then there's kind of the, the basic behavioral stuff, that if trying to use some of these protocols makes something more likely to be, um, or makes it more difficult for that person to comply with the general fundamentals of nutrition, then it may be contraindicated, right? So if we can make all these kind of <coughs> these theoretical claims of the benefits you could have, but what if by someone trying to stick to an early time restricted feeding protocol, they actually don't end up eating as good quality foods as they normally do? or the same amount of calories that they normally do, or find it really stressful or doesn't fit their life, they don't have anything to eat after training. All these fundamental things that we know about nutrition already, if it undermines them, then it's probably not something that we uh, should do. So be aware of those things when taking this into account. So to kind of summarize that with some conclusions, some things that I think I know, uh, first thing that I say about most stuff is I really don't know anything, um, at least for sure. And this is not really, with, this can be do with anything. I just don't know anything. I'm not that sure about it. But, so with that, I've kind of, I try to think of things like probabilistically. So based on what we see, and what is out there, and what kind of makes sense to me, where do things kind of lean that I think makes good intuitive sense? And then hopefully I've presented some of the basis that we see in research that would support some of these ideas about you should at least take this into account with your nutrition decisions. We have lots of questions that still remain, like what is the optimal length of a feeding window? Like most stuff looks at eight hours, but is six better? Is nine better? Is there a threshold which it becomes okay? How much does it matter? Is most the benefit from restricting the feeding, or is it just simply the benefits we get from the extended fast? How frequently do we need to do that? How much of an impact does it have biasing calories to the earlier part of the day? There's a couple of groups in the UK that are actually doing studies right now looking at this of biasing more calories early in the day. Um, uh, so the University of Surrey have some stuff going on, University of Aberdeen. But we still need to answer those questions. Beyond all that, if I can get one thing, is that circadian alignment matters, or just taking care of your circadian rhythms, your circadian biologies matters a whole lot. So that relates to sleep and wake, which we didn't get a chance to really discuss too much. As I said, it relates to your light and dark exposure. So the things that I'm sure you've heard before about limiting artificial light at night, or at least bright blue light from your devices or from other LEDs, can, that can disrupt your pattern of melatonin, so stay away from those. But also equally important is getting that blue light exposure earlier today. So getting out and getting some daylight in the early part of the day actually will help and it's at least anecdotally, one of the things that seems to help a lot with uh, clients that we've had that have sleep issues is not just taking care of what they do in around sleep. One of them is actually getting them to focus on getting some of that light exposure early in the day, and that actually sets them up for better sleep later. Based on what we said, 
maybe factor some of this stuff into your nutrition decisions, but don't let it undermine those fundamentals. So take all this with the caveats that I've presented, the, the huge grain of salt that I've presented, but also hopefully it gives you some pause and reflection of when we say things like, oh, as, as long as you're hitting your macros, like, it doesn't really matter. It's like, in some contexts, maybe, but when we're talking about general health and all the things nutrition can do, we maybe need to think a bit more critically about questions like that, that there may be differences, something to consider, but don't let it undermine all those fundamental pieces. As I mentioned at the outset, um, I've basically, because I was one to show all the studies I wanted, I've listed them all at a link here. If you go there, I've linked them up, there's about, it depends on how good you are, there's about 50 if you want, that basically, hopefully, show you that this wasn't complete nonsense if you get a chance to read them. I'll give you, you can download the slides from there, and I've also linked up to other podcast articles related to circadian biology and this kind of chronic nutrition field that may be useful if this was of interest to you. If you thought this was nonsense, then apologies for the past hour. <laughs> holding you up, but all I can say is that the good news is I can now give you a promise of coffee and food uh, because I think we're set for lunch. So I think I'm out of time, but if you do have any questions, just before you go, you can write them down so you don't forget for the Q&A later, and I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, with that, thank you for listening. Keep up a lot.